was ich dir noch angesäche, so bist du sie alle Ehre. Was ist Wundes hier geschehe? Das ein Magd, ein Kind All right, everybody, we're live. So our apologies, viewers, for just being a, a, a couple minutes behind schedule here. Um, but welcome to this conversation, which I have titled The Grapes of Wrath. Um, I'm joined by, this is the greatest gathering of, of lit cells the internet has ever known. <laughs> I'm, I'm joined by Dan Baltic of New Right Podcast, author of Nutcranker. Dan, good to have you as Great well. To be here. Thank as, you for the invite. Definitely, definitely. As well as Lomez um, from, from Passage Press. Unfortunately, we were we were hoping hoping to have raw egg nationalist as well, because I know this is a topic he could really contribute to, but unfortunately he had a, a last minute conflict. Um but, but I think I should just start. Oh, and Lomez, you might be I don't, shuffling from papers or something you might want to mute your mic that's not me oh, oh that's Dan. Oh, that, yeah that's me sorry that's guys. the nut cranker all right <laughs> beauty in here so um i reached out to to, to these two guys because i thought they'd be be sort of the perfect um guests to discuss this so broadly speaking i wanted to talk about and explore the influence uh that can still be felt today by the generation of writers that um, I'm, I'm now I'm, I'm borrowing a term from David Foster Wallace. This was this is a Wallaceism. This is how he he termed this generation of writers was the great male narcissists. Um, so this would include um, it, it actually includes I believe both men of the silent generation as well as baby boomers. But this is a generation of writers kind of typified by Philip Roth. Hence the Grapes of Wrath, Norman Mailer, John Updike, Saul Bellow. Um, I think I'd, I'd, I'd include Frederick Exley there as well. And, um, and, and many others, you know, if we were going to talk about poetry, I'd probably lump in John Berryman into there. Mm. So these, these, these writers all, all obviously vary quite differently in, in style and, and tone. And while their books explore a lot of different subjects, I would say one subject that did sort of fascinate all of these men um, was male lust and desire. <laughs> and I think Philip Roth in, in, in the publication of, of Portnoy's Complaint is often sort of attributed, is, is considered as sort of the dam breaking mm. when it came to, uh, I guess, what was you might kind of consider it similar to sort of a Hollywood code when it came to movies and the sort of things that could be depicted and discussed in, in movies. Um, so this, this generation sort of wrote openly and honestly about sex in a way that was, I guess, if not explicitly prohibited, um, a lot less common in earlier generations of novelists, maybe like Henry Miller being the one exception to that. And I, I think it might be unfair to say that these writers glorified in this, um, because they all certainly wrote about the the, the attendant suffering and, and the downsides of of desire and and longing and, and male libido. But I think maybe it's a fair description to say that they at least wrote about it unapologetically. So these are men that wrote about infidelities divorces um some real and some fictional <laughs> and some kind of hard to differentiate 
um, the sort of insatiable nature of of the male sexual appetite. And it, of course, without exception, they 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 were accused of of misogyny and of having a very low opinion of women and a very one sided depiction of women in their fiction. Um, and I would I, I I think it's important to to note as well though that. While most women of younger generations d dismiss them, you know, like I've never met like a millennial female Roth fan. I think it is worth noting that they're uh, amongst their own generation, while well, uh, women writers might have criticized their attitudes and, and depictions of women to some extent, they would at the same time sort of defend their, their literary talent and their literary Im importance. Right. So Susan Sontag might, might not have, uh, appreciated them, but she's not. She she wouldn't. Um, I think doubt their um, their greatness. Um, and the other thing to note, and I really do want to get to you guys and, and get your your thoughts on on this generation. But I think a few things to kind of lay out here. Maybe I think we're we're all a bit on the older side, so so Gen Z or younger millennials might not have a full fuller the, the same kind of picture and the same kind of sense that we do for these writers, but. These writers really and truly were the, the last generation of literary rock stars. I mean, you do get certain kind of cult of personality writers like like David Foster Wallace, who we'll probably talk about at some point. But this is really a period in at least, I think, American and British letters where a novelist could be said to hold as much sort of cultural clout as like a famous singer or actor or, or film director, you know, every educated person read and discussed <clears throat> these books. Um, and even the women who despise them read and discussed these books. Um, and these guys were still very much kind of taught and revered as, as literary lions when, when I was in college, which was in, in the early two thousands. Um, this is definitely who I, I at the time looked up to. I mean, at that point, Wallace had published Infinite Jest and, and his sort of um, reputation was on the rise, but certainly I don't, not, not, not within the academy. Um, within the academy, these, these boomer auteurs were still in, in ascendance and sort of considered sort of the reigning aristocracy of Western <laughs> fiction. Um, and so it's very common for literary young men to aspire to their heights. Um, I think it was more common at that point to, to find people that admired these baby boomer writers as opposed to Gen X writers. I think that's probably less true for like Gen Z. Um, uh, and the last point I'll make is it, it sort of it goes without saying that none of these men could be published today. <laughs> Um, you know, most of them, a lot of them passed away just prior to the, the Me Too movement and thus avoided cancellation only only due to kind of suffering a more permanent cancellation. Um, <laughs> you know, we, I, I'm not we can absolutely kind of talk about that. I'm not particularly interested in exploring the, the obvious fact that these writers could neither be, be championed or, or really capable of succeeding today, though that, that's certainly something we can explore. Um, I'm, I'm more kind of interested in asking a, perhaps a broader question, um, not so much who, who, ki who killed the rock star male novelist, but uh, you know, whether that's the Me Too movement or a cow the cowardly publishing industry, um, or maybe even kind of the writers themselves through their own sort of unapologetic narcissism and, and the reaction of a younger generation of writers to this. Um, did, did, did the culture at large, in fact, sort of grow tired of them and, and rightfully so? So I'm really kind of more, more interested in asking these questions. Is it, is it in fact good that these writers have sort of are, are gone and are faded from the cultural ima imagination? Um, you know, I want to spend, the second half of this talk kind of exploring their their influence in writers like Wellbeck and Wallace and 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 Dan Baltic and, oh, uh, yeah. and, and delicious tacos because I think they all kind of react very differently to these guys um is is the is the spirit and ethos or perhaps eros of these men something that needs to be recaptured 
by the current generation of male writers or is is the legacy of these guys a bit more i guess a- ambiguous <laughs> than than that so i've talked for for long enough that's my my opening kind of salvo um i don't know if either of you wants to to go first with just kind of your your initial thoughts about um the great male narcissists i'll uh I'll slip in here or else I'm going to forget what I was going to say. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's a lot there. I'm not going to cover everything in this in this first answer. But um, one of the items at the tail end of that um, opening was the question of what happened to the rock star novelist. Um, I you know, there's a there's a lot of explanations potentially for this that might have to do with uh you know, certain constraints around what our culture allows and um, what passes for sort of mainstream cultural products. Um, It could be an an effect of the novel itself just being a sort of passe form. But I think maybe a more parsimonious explanation is just that there are no rock stars of any kind. I mean, there are no Mm -hmm. rock star rock stars anymore. Uh, let alone rock star novelists. And I think an explanation for that is simply that our, our culture is so fractured. Um, and this has been going on for quite a while, but certainly like in this digital age we're in, it's become, it, it's accelerated. And so there just is no place where you can have a central figure uh, opining about this or that um, idea uh, that would capture the attention of let's say a, a sort of sophisticated, educated, quote unquote, elite audience that spans the political spectrum, that spans sort of um, uh, age gaps and generational gaps. There just isn't a place in the culture for anyone um, of any stripe uh, to occupy. Um, so I think that that's part of the explanation too. We're just in a new cultural moment um, where a rock star per se just can't really exist, uh, not in the way it did, you know, 50 years ago. As for, um, you know, the other thing I just want to say about these guys generally is that um, they are writing, it, it, my understanding of their writing is uh, the tension of the ordeal of horniness, okay? that That's really what oh, the, what it the, is the, they're doing. The ordeal doing. of horniness would have been another great uh, title for this stream. Yeah. <laughs> And, and I think that arises at a very particular historical moment that cannot be disaggregated from women's lib. And you certainly see this with Mailer. OK, that this is like the, the center point of his um, public career is navigating this tension between these sort of liberal, progressive cultural movements, um, centrally feminism and women's lib. And then also trying to reconcile what that does to men who are now sort of in this milieu where suddenly they're exposed to accessible women. And, you know, like Mailer, I think, did he have seven wives, six wives, whatever it is, like, you know, um, Updike, of course, uh, all of his novels are also about these guys who just flit from one woman to another. Um, you know, dealing, just basically trying to deal with their horniness. And could these guys be writing this stuff now? I mean, maybe, but it would it would be very passe. Like, I remember uh, reading the Rabbit books for the first time, and there's this scene where Rabbit Angstrom is tormented over this episode where his wife is, like, giving him a blowjob, okay? It's like, <laughs> it just it just feels very dated. It, 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 it doesn't really... Uh, have much resonance you know we we have our own weird uh sort of sexual mores now and weird sexual tensions um from like dating apps and uh you know like a guy like tacos or julia beck like they they've figured out how to write about this but it wouldn't i don't think it would make sense um for like to have like an updated like very horny norman mailer or uh philip roth um writing a version of these novels today um, they're just they're they're sort of dated in a way that's not just different in in degree, but different in kind. So that's what I'll that's what I'll say for now. I think also just that I, I think if they were writing today, it would be that their the the male protagonist would not be quite as successful <laughs> as their like yeah, their yeah. literary their literary counterparts because I, I I mean people are just having a less sex than 
the you know 60s boomer generation was um but 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 dan what are your um what are you what are your thoughts about about these yeah guys? so i i second lomez here and yourself that there is obviously a disconnect between current readers and the great male narcissists roth mailer updike not novelists of that generation and some of that disconnect is uh just the product of a cultural disconnect because we're in different generations and so the kind of the complaints the you know um the problems even the like the um epistemology the way of understanding the world of writers of that generation will i mean obviously it's going to piss off liberal millennial and zoomer women but even men you'll read it and you'll be like oh this you know doesn't you know this doesn't make sense this doesn't seem appropriate this like doesn't fit with like the way i would construe the world and of course it doesn't it's it's from you know an, an earlier era but to the extent it's annoying i think it's annoying to some because well frankly we have inherited the world that the silent generation and the boomers collaborated to create which you know obviously has its issues so to the extent that you see these guys kind of like complaining well like so mailer um you know updike roth they were kind of their generation was enjoying the best of the party they kind of they loosened all the restrictions they you know they kind of opened up sexuality everything of that nature and got to like really just go to town and i mean i'm sure that was great that was awesome that being said you know if you're a reader from today reading this you you cannot read their fiction without thinking okay well to some extent is this how or why we are where we are today so there, there's an element of that but to i mean speak to speak more broadly to the kind of the great male narcissists and the kind of evolution of that uh genre of writing about sex to the the you know people who write about sex today be it um wellbeck tacos uh my myself dan baltic or um, even others who all kind of class as more apologetic male writers who write about sex, like uh, to not to, you know, cast aspersions about quality of fiction, because these are excellent writers, Sam Lipsight, um, Jonathan Franzen, Gary Steingart. I, you know, I feel that there are um, current writers who are writing about sex and uh you know some of them are writing about it in a way that is you know maybe more like still trying to write about these things without getting canceled understanding that feminism and the triumph of feminism and you know various other ideologies has changed the playing field so you know some writers especially from the 90s the you know the early 2000s responded to it by kind of adopting this um kind of crouching you know trying to shield themselves uh, uh this apologetic stance that some of these writers male writers writing about sex have adopted but i think what we do see is we see kind of broadly two strains of uh men writing about sex and fiction and we see the great male narcissists as we've discussed who um are kind of embodying a madman-esque motif of you know kind of triumphant you know sexual um you know libertinism within the context of a more uh virtuous and you know cohesive society and so for many reasons for the same reason you see madman and you're like oh gee that would never fly today and you know there's some you know, there, there are issues with the writing of writers of those generations from, you know, various people. But we see, I think, a progression in the kind of, well, feminism and all of the movements of the 60s and 70s and what have you. They, they had their say and the, um, you know, the product, the problems, the issues were maybe not necessarily felt keenly in the, the 70s or even the 80s 
but are really now being felt today very keenly in the post me too movement the you know all of this you know the the current the current year so to say so now we have writers like uh wellbeck like tacos like myself like some other more apologetic male writers who are kind of would similarly and, and are accused of misogyny but are accused of a misogyny that I think is very different in form <laughs> than the misogyny that like Roth or whomever was being accused of. This is more rather than like the madman motif of like misogyny where just kind of of powerful men just having conquests and what have you, the kind of um, the great male narcissists of today, if even if, if we are narcissists, are um, you know more of an you know an, an incel core <laughs> uh, motif where we're you know dealing with the actual sexual economy that exists today, which is an, a sexual economy that is you know uh, heavily involves or revolves around the concept of hypergamy and Me Too and all of these other issues. So in a sense, I think that the current uh, writers. The, you know, the current great male narcissists and the great male narcissists of their day, the, the mailers, the, you know, updikes, the Roths, they are all, we are all just writing about sex, honestly. And that's just going to, you know, appear different to other, to everyone. A man writing honestly about sex today is going to, his writing is going to seem very different than that of Philip Roth's. But the unifying feature here is that it will piss off women regardless. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 fair. You know, it's it's funny too. I think it's worth worth commenting on. I, I agree. I think you both seem to be saying that there's something very dated about these guys now. And it's funny because I, I mean I can I rem I read like all of Philip Roth's novels when I was in, in college in my like young early twenties. And even though these are sort of you know, grim portraits of like a, a middle-aged man kind of continually ruining his life by, by chasing pussy. I, I can remember still just sort of like admiring him and, and saying to myself like, oh, you know, like life wouldn't, won't be that bad if, if this is my future or like this is how I turn out. And, you know, now being in my forties, my I, I think I attempted to pick up you know, my life as a man a, a little while ago, which is just one of his m many Zuckerman mm. books. And I, it, it's so, so much less palatable. There's, mm. I mean, there's something, um, I guess I have just changed and, and, and aged, but the, the, the portraits that these books paint are land very differently when you're no longer like a, um, you know, a horny 20 something in college. <laughs> Yeah, um, absolutely. I think one one issue here too, though, is that um, just just as an artistic matter, uh, sex writing ages really poorly, uh, in my view, and um, it just it it comes off as sort of cringe in the same way that uh, like edgy humor ages really poorly. Like when we look back at like Lenny Bruce or something, it's just very cringe and sort of boring, and it's hard to sort of recapture the context in which saying these things or in the case of like this sex writing, observing these things has some um, sort of immediate, uh, like is making this immediate social commentary and maybe sort of uh, intriguing to audiences of the time. But for some reason, that sort of thing just just doesn't last, just doesn't stand the test of time. And I, you know, I, this may just be a personal taste thing. Um, but I would say like one, one author in this camp of guys who I think does age very well is John Cheever. And I, and I don't think it's incidental that he's gay. Okay. And so he doesn't have the same kind of like horny obsession. Um, it's all very repressed in his writing and, you know, Cheever's sexuality was like a matter of some, some mystery, I guess, but his writing still, in my view, um, obtains today it still has like a lot of value that I, when i go back and read some of this mailer stuff or you know earlier roth or updike or bellow or like james salter or something 
it's just so obsessed with its own horniness that I, I find it hard to get through sometimes. Yeah, I, I get, and I guess to, I think this is kind of why in my opening statement, I, I, I mentioned, I, I think that like the cancel culture and, and me too, I think that's something that it, that can be largely o- oversold. I guess I should I should add a caveat to that. I I have absolutely no doubt that very very talented male writers are being passed over um <laughs> or neglected by by the publishing industry, but even if that weren't the case, I think if 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 somebody was approaching sex in the same style and manner as the GM ends, I think it would just sort of fail on its own. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't think we can just sort of necessarily place all, all the blame for this on, um, on the sort sort of the, the current nature of, of, of publishing. Um, but I, I wanted to, um, I'm kind of divided here. I, I wanted to, to bring both Wallace and Welbeck into the conversation and i'm a little i'm not sure which one it makes more sense to to begin with but i i had a few quotes here from wallace on this generation and since you know we stole the title great male narcissist from this this man Mm -hmm. i thought i'd just take a minute here to to quickly read a couple of um a couple of paragraphs where he's talking about these men and then kind of examine his reaction to them within his, his writing. I think that, I guess I'll say up front just to lay it out there. I think Welbeck and Wallace present these kind of very interesting and somewhat diametrically opposed reactions to the boomer writers in that I think DFW is obviously very critical of them, but I think his response was to really just not write about sex (laughs) that, that often at all. Whereas Welbeck is still, writing constantly about sex but with this this added layer of misanthropy and nihilism um which i think he blames he puts squarely on the shoulders of these boomers but but let me just give a couple this is a few uh paragraphs here from a book review that dfw did for john updike's novel toward the end of time this came out in, in the observer in 1997 so here's a quote Mailer Updike Roth, the great male narcissists who've dominated post-war realist fiction are now in their senescence, and it must seem to them no coincidence that the prospect of their own deaths appears backlit by the approaching millennium and online predictions of the death of the novel as we know it. When a solipsist dies, after all, everything goes with him, and no U.S. novelist has mapped the the solipsist's terrain better than John Updike whose rise in the 60s and 70s established him as both chronicler and voice of probably the single most self-absorbed generation since Louis XVI. I think the major reason so many of my generation dislike Mr. Updike and other GMNs has to do with these writers' radical self-absorption and with their uncritical celebration of this self-absorption, both in themselves and in their characters. I'm guessing that for the young, educated adults of the 60s and 70s, for whom the ultimate horror was the hypocritical conformity and repression of their own parents' generation, Mr. Updike's evocation of the libidinous self appeared redemptive and even heroic. But the young, educated adults of the 90s, who were, of course, the children of the same impassioned infidelities and divorces Mr. Updike wrote about so beautifully, got to watch all this brave new individualism and self-expression and sexual freedom deteriorate into the joyless and anomic self-indulgence of the me generation. Maybe the only thing the reader ends up appreciating about Ben Turnbull, that's the John Updike proxy and protagonist of the book, is that he's such a broad caricature of an Updike protagonist that he helps us figure out what's been so unpleasant and frustrating about this gifted author's recent characters. It's not that Turnbull is stupid. He can quote Kierkegaard Kierkegaard and Pascal on angst and allude to the deaths of Schubert and Mozart and distinguish between a sinistrose and a dextrose, polygonum vine, etc. 
It's that he persists in the bizarre adolescent idea that getting to have sex with whomever one wants, whenever one wants, is a cure for ontological despair. And so, it appears, does Mr. Updike. He makes it plain that he views the narrator's impotence as catastrophic, as the ultimate symbol of death itself, and he clearly wants us to mourn it as much as Turnbull does. I'm not especially offended by this attitude. I mostly just don't get it. Erect or flaccid, Ben Turnbull's unhappiness is obvious right from the book's first page, but it never once occurs to him that the reason he's so unhappy is that he's an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so I mean, obviously DFW had nothing, um, n nothing particularly good to say about these 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 writers for the most part. Although he is an, an apologist for for Updike's prose style, I should say that. Mm -hmm. But I, I I will say that I think that yeah, I mean, what was the the line, the riddle of horniness that we had <laughs> earlier? The um, ordeal of horniness. The ordeal, the ordeal of horniness. I I, I think that Updike. Or no, sorry, not Updike. Wallace kind of simply sidesteps the ordeal of horniness in in his writing, and I guess yeah, I think it's oh, worth, worth so. noting that that I'm particularly thinking of Infinite Jest at the moment. But I mean that 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 book was published in the late '90s and deals with the near future. So what you could probably say accurately is around the 2020s. So he's writing about Gen Z sexuality, or he, he's sort of like mm -hmm. pro prognosticating Gen Z sexuality, which when you think about it that way is sort of um, uh, impressive and and yeah. and surprising because uh, the, for the most part, these characters are these, his characters are these very kind of atomized mm -hmm. individuals. He, he only ever deals with sex in this very oblique manner. And I think that that's maybe a generalization that, that can be made. About one, Gen one, Z. E one exception here might be though, um, his, he wrote this essay. He, he, uh, visited, um, the, uh, porn awards. I can't remember what the, uh, exact oh, yeah. awards the, are. And uh, I think the, 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 the big red, yeah. And I, I think <laughs> the essay is called big red sun or something like this. Um, and it's, it's this great essay, but, uh, what he's interested in is like merely the spectacle of sex. So by the time, by the time Wallace is writing, you know, and these, these sort of Gen Xers are writing all this stuff that the, that the boomers and silent generation writers who preceded them, um, it's boring by now. Okay. By the mid nineties, like, you know, Madonna has her like sex book and like, you know, suburban moms and dads like have it on their shelves. Like there's nothing transgressive about it. It's sort of everywhere. There's nothing interesting to say about it. I guess like there's maybe a brief period where like AIDS is like relevant, but that that's very boring. The only sort of sexual writing that you get that has any, sort of newness to it is gay writing. Okay. So if you're gay, suddenly this whole landscape opens up and all these gay writers start talking about being gay and what that means. But if you're just a, like a straight, straight white male, um, there's just nothing interesting left to say about sex, except the way in which it has become this kind of this spec, this spectacle. Uh, it's, it's treated as, you know, like in that essay, um, everything Wallace has to say about it is, is more or less like played for laughs. It's, it's the absurdity yeah. of sex. There's nothing like in, again, in, in Roth and, you know, in, in Updike, there's this sort of, uh, very self serious, like sort of torment over how they should, uh, sort of navigate this sexual landscape. Um, it, it's sort of totally devoid of humor. Whereas right. in, in Wallace, despite, Wallace being sort of over irony in the sincere writer, uh, quote unquote, it's very ironic. That's, that's the only lens he can see sex through. Um, and, and actually one, now that I'm on this subject, I think the next progression then, like when you get to a writer like Delicious Tacos, he has Wallace's humor. It's still funny. He's self-aware enough that he recognizes the humor in this sort of sex obsession and the other thing that differs from Roth is, um, or, or Updike in this case, is in, if you look at Wallace's critique of, Ra, of, of the Updike, it's that this Turnbull character has no um, 
perception that this sex obsession is vapid and hollow and is not sort of the way to a good life. What does he say about sex being the answer to ontological despair and this mistake yeah. that Updike is making about that? So what Tacos has done, and Welbeck, for example, but Tacos, you know, more in a more immediate sense, is very aware that this sex sort of the sex capades that he's on is absolutely not the answer to ontological despair. That, right. that there's, there has to be some other and better way of living his life. However, in the meantime, under the circumstances, I'm going to continue on with this because what else is there to do? This is, it, you know, but um, he, he has a much healthier view of sex, or at least it's an updated view that takes into full consideration the sort of sexual marketplace dynamics that we're in. So there, there you yeah. can see a kind of progression there. I think I think that's I, I'm glad that you kind of brought in delicious tacos because I think in, if if anybody's kind of an optimist, <laughs> I mean his stuff his stuff can get pretty dark, but there's there's mm. certainly a fair amount of of humor in delicious tacos as well. And the one thing I, I the other thing I'd say about delicious tacos is, I, you know, Dan, Dan and I did a whole spring with a, a, a stream with with Astral on David Foster Wallace, and and this kind of is a subject that came up for us a lot because. I think that Delicious Tacos is is a writer that is navigating the sexual um, milieu of the day um, and doing it quite well. And I think that, you know, well, maybe Dave, Davis, David Foster Wallace is kind of a commentator uh, and an ironist and a humorist about it. I don't think that that's the same thing as navigating it. And regardless, I guess what what dampens his criticism for me of the great male narcissists is that, yeah, he's sort of kind of rolling his eye, his eyes at this this kind of fixation on libido. Uh, but it's not it's not something that I think he. I, I think he steered away from that in his fiction. Mm -hmm. Um and I get just kind of given his his particular style. I don't know how he would deal with it as as a subject, but um, but yeah, I guess the, I don't think it's ever anything that Wallace confronted head on in a way that was either prescriptive or um, yeah. I guess it. I don't want to. I, I don't want to sound like I'm accusing him of being sort of cowardly when it comes to this. But you know, another. <laughs> Another interesting question and one that I, I had, because I have no really contemporary examples of this, I, I think that one uh, worthy and um, anticipated reaction to the great male narcissist would be for people to kind of write about love, <laughs> which is also something I don't think that that Wallace writes about. And in, in Delicious Tacos, you sort of sent experience his his longing for a deeper more meaningful relationship but of, of all the writers of all of the contemporary writers i picked to to discuss i don't think anybody writes about love as as mm. an, an, an antidote to lust and i will I, I just one other point here i think if we turn back the the clock a little bit further to to the 19th century or if we think about earlier novelists like um Jane Austen or, or George Eliot, or, or I think even Leo Tolstoy is a good example of this in some regards. You you have books, you have novels about love conquering lust, mm. you know? And, and I think that's it, 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 maybe the broadest statement I could make about the, the baby boomer generation of male novelists is, it, is it's when lust began to conquer love in the novel. And I can't say that we've had any writer who's attempted to re rehabilitate love or just, I don't know, complex male and, and female sure, relationships. Yeah. And maybe that's, that's given the times we live in and the, the tensions between men and women and, and the low birth rates and the people not coupling that's, that's fair. But, um, but yeah, I don't know if, if either of you guys have, have thoughts I about, don't about that think that there's necessarily a clear dividing line between love and lust, at least in terms of, is it difficult for male writers today to write about those things? Because if you want to be published by the mainstream publishing industry, certainly if you're a straight male writer writing about lust, 
you will face significant uh, headwinds. But uh, in, but two, if you're writing about love, um, I mean, that's, that still takes place within, if you're writing honestly about it, if you're not writing like a, you know, erotic fiction or a romance novel or some sort of just cucked novel that is, you know, not true to it, you know, yourself or itself, you are going to write a story that takes place in 2022, 2023, whatever, and has to contend with the current dating marketplace has to contend with, uh, as I mentioned earlier, hypergamy, me too, all of this stuff. And of course there's, you know, that is just, you know, that is not the stuff of love. That is even, certainly not even the stuff of sex, but I mean, it, it is ambient, it is in the environment and it does inform courtship. It informs all of these things. So like if any man is going to write honestly about any of this, he's going to risk cancellation and thus, um, you know, per the uh, suggested reading before the this episode, where are the rock star male novelists? Well, if you can't write about sex and you can't write about love and you can't write about most forms of interpersonal conflict, uh, well, there's really not a, left, a lot left for you to write about. So <laughs> that uh, I think that is the issue, what, you know, that is facing male writers today and the publishing industry as a whole because this is not uh limited even to straight male writers uh even you know um writers of you know or, who are male writers but of different ethnicities or even different sexual orientations women as well we live in such at this time a such a censorious culture that regardless of you know who is writing what Yes, straight male writers have it the worst, but, uh, you know, show me a novel that was published last year that was good. <laughs> and, you know, anyone, <laughs> anyone, you know, who, who wrote a novel, it, you know, and like, if, if anything, you know, recent fiction, that's good, you know, certainly because, you know, straight white men get the least leeway, we, you know, are allowed to write the least. But even those who have more leeway, they still have to submit it to this censorious machine. And the thing that comes out at the end is, you know, it's it's cocked. It's not it's not good. It's just it's, you know, not so. I mean, there, there are some good writers. There are some good. And so that's what I was trying to get at earlier, where I was trying to distinguish between the more apologetic male writers, the Steingarts, the. Um, you know, I got, I love Lipsight, but there are elements of his fiction where I'm reading it and I'm like, okay, you're, you know, you're apologizing too much. Um, and, and others of, of their ilk, Franzen, a tremendous writer, Franzen, but, you know, regardless, there, you know, is certainly an element of, please forgive me for my white male opinions <laughs> in there. And that's, you know, that's not honest, really. I, I would hope that's not honest. So what you have, I think now, and this is the white pill, as far as I'm concerned, what you have is a generation of, you know, young male writers or youngish male writers coming up now, or, you know, who were previously disenfranchised, but just started writing like tacos, like Welbeck, like myself to a certain degree, like, you know, many, many others who, you know, whose names we don't even know yet. And they are writing fiction that is, you know, honest and is not, you know, um, capitulating in any meaningful sense and is telling the truth as we see it. So, yeah, I mean, I think there there is a real future for the the uh, great male narcissist. I think there's a new generation of great male narcissists. They're just not in the system and uh, they, they can't be. But they're they're writing, and that's that's great. Hmm. I, Lomez, do you have anything to add to that, or or do you want me to move on to Welbeck? I'll I'll just add a little piece here, and and one reason I uh, I think I have an interesting perspective on this is because through the course of um, running these Passage Prize contests over the last few years, I've seen literally thousands of submissions coming from precisely this pool of previously uh, neglected writers that um, Dan is referring to here. 
Um, much of it is like very green and much of it is bad and sort of hopelessly bad, um, which is to be expected. But a lot of it is is good. And um, but what I'm what I'm sort of waiting for, though, and, and have yet to see is that if there is going to be a um, sort of not a renaissance of the novel, a sort of rejuvenation of the form it's going to require people, um, writers, sort of experimenting a little bit more. Um, I think a lot of writers are still stuck in this kind of like 20th century idea of what a novel should look like and the sort of paces that that novel should go through. And um, this is very much borrowed from not just uh, the Ross and the Updikes, but, uh, you know, the Raymond Carvers and, uh, you know, Dennis Johnson's. And, and by the way, I love all these writers, but I think we need something fundamentally new. I think we, what I'm waiting for is the like bronze age mindsets uh, novel. Okay. This guy, some guy, some writer who can it completely explodes this form, both in style, how these stories are told and that, that better takes into account not just the uh, sort of cultural, moral, and and uh, political ideas that are left off the table by mainstream publishing and, and legacy publishing, um, but that also take into account this new kind of digital environment we're in and how information is translated. I mean, one guy who does this, I think, very well is Zero HP Lovecraft, if you read his short stories. Yes. Um, they're, they're very technically sound. So as a pro stylist, he's a very strong writer. He just has a natural ability to sort of produce, uh, you know, well-measured sentences. But also he's thinking more broadly about um, these particular kinds of information um, networks and information channels that we're all operating in and thinking about how that affects our understanding of story and narrative. And in his case, it's been through short stories. I've, I have word that he may be working on a novel. So I, I'm looking for someone though, who really does sort of explode the form in some way. And, and I haven't quite seen that yet. Like I, I look, I love tacos. I love our guys. And a lot of the novels we've seen are very good, uh, Nutcranker included. Uh, by our own Dan Baltic. Um, and, but, but I'm still looking for something that, that really breaks out of this kind of stuck uh, mode that the novel has been in, let's say, for the last 20 years. No, Lomez, I imagine that you deal with a lot of um, uh, submissions that are either, either David Foster Wallace impersonations or Welbeck Im impersonations people that are uh, trying to ape that style i wish i had more of that um i don't see that as much you know the the guy who's imitated probably more than anyone else is cormac mccarthy you know mm. faulkner mccarthy it's a lot of this kind of uh southern gothic <laughs> yeah and, and sort of like biblical language which is very good and i and i can understand why writers use that as a as a starting place um but no, I actually don't see, I thought I would see more sort of this David Foster Wallace type, um, but it's it's not there. I don't see that as much. Uh, Welbeck, I see some of this kind of, um, you know, it's hard to describe, like, what is Welbeck's style? So what would it mean to, like, mimic Welbeck? Like, he yeah. doesn't maybe, have... Maybe not even so much his style, Lomez, but I would just, like, uh, his pessimism. I'm yes, like yes, yes. A lot of sexual pessimism and like sex bots and very bleak, like uh, near future dystopian settings right. um, where these guys are kind of like stuck in a kind of uh, masturbatory hell. OK. And, and so, yeah, <laughs> you, you do you do see a lot of that for sure. So maybe that's a good point to kind of segue into Welbeck a, a little bit. And again, I I I contrast Welbeck and Wallace here because I think that they, they they're very kind of polar reactions to this generation of writers again I think DFW sort of scoffed at these guys and then kind of el elided you know the issue of, of sex in can I ways. can I just jump and I want to interject with like one small point on this um yeah. 
about David Foster Wallace. So I think you're right, certainly, that in his fiction, he just doesn't talk about it at all um, to his detriment. And it makes his fiction far less sort of three-dimensional. But he was starting to, I think. And I think, you know, one of the many reasons why his uh, his suicide was a tragedy um, was I think he was starting to think about these things more seriously in his fiction. And in his last, I believe it was his last published piece of fiction, was a short story for the New Yorker called, uh, if I remember right, Good People. And it's about these two uh, high school kids, a boy and a girl who, um, the, the girl's pregnant. They've, you know, they've, uh, this guy's knocked her up and they're like deeply religious sort of Christian kids. And they're, the whole story is them just like sitting on this park bench, sort of contemplating what to do about this and whether the woman's going to go through with an abortion. Almost like, um, but it's kind of all unstated, much the same way that Hill's, Uh, like white elephants, the abortion conversation is unstated in that Hemingway story. But, but Wallace in this story is very sympathetic um, to this question of like sexuality and sex and uh, the, the, the implications of sex and that thing we were talking about previously love. And at the end of this story, they determine like they're in love with each other or they, if they're not yet in love with each other, they could be in love with, with each other. And we, we leave the story with them deciding to keep the baby. And it's this very wholesome, optimistic story about love and, 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 you know, young lust. Okay. Like that gave rise to this problem in the first place. So anyway, I, I I like to tell people to read that story. I have always really liked that story and it indicates that Wallace might've been going down an interesting path. Um, had he, had he lived a little bit longer. Uh, but anyway, I just want to interject that point. That's very interesting and very, very, atypical of, of him. Yeah. And yeah. Again, like I go back and forth between sort of considering him this kind of like sexist, like sexless automaton on these matters. And mm. when I actually think that's, that's very praiseworthy because he, he kind of preceded and predicted this strangely kind of sexless um, digital hellscape that we live in. So <laughs> it's hard to, it's hard to know what to, to, to hold him accountable for, but um but yeah, let's talk. Let's talk a little bit about Welbeck. Um, and I, I, I mentioned, you know, I was sort of um, an admirer of of these boomer writers throughout my college career and, until I hit my senior year. And, and my senior year is when somebody handed me a, a copy of the, the Elementary Particles. Mm. Um, and uh, my God, like I, I, <laughs> like I when I put down that book, like part of me wanted to go and just like join a monastery or something. Um, because unlike, I, I think, whereas Wallace sort of just denies the perspective of these baby boomers, Welbeck writes about sort of sex in a way that like philosophers write about the death of God after Nietzsche. Like maybe that's a strange analogy, but there's really like he he cannot simply elide or or ignore or scoff at at the world that that the baby boomers kind of brought, and so his unlike Wallace his his books all the books I've read are are dripping with with sex perhaps even mm-hmm. more sex than than any of the the GMNs that we've been discussing, but and there's this there's I, I guess a seriousness in dealing with sex, like Welbeck is somebody who is sexually obsessed and he does not see any way out of this quagmire. I mean, he sort of views all of Western culture as being sexually obsessed, but it's, it's not some, we, we can't really return to any level of innocence any more than we could like an un- event, like the nuclear bomb, you know, it's right. just this, this, bomb that has gone off and he is sort of living in this um this wasteland that, that the boomers made for us I, I, and i have just a couple of quick passages so people can get kind of a taste of how he i should have gotten a, some uh passages from roth or or mailer or, or updike but um if people are familiar with their prose then then you can see how some of this kind of differs and again it's sort of his 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 fiction is usually kind of half depictions of sex, very kind of raw and jarring, not particularly erotic 
descriptions and depictions of, of sex and lust interspersed with these just sort of an exegesis uh, of philosophy, sort of him espousing his, his misanthropy. <laughs> um, so there's here just a few quotes here. The terrible predicament of a beautiful girl is that only an experienced womanizer, some cynical, someone cynical and without scruple, feels up to the challenge. More often than not, she will lose her virginity to some filthy lowlife in what proves to be the first step in an irrevocable decline. And this is this is the most quintessential passage that I could I could find. In in the elementary particles, there's a protagonist who's a bit of a he's named Michelle, so very much kind of a stand-in for Welbeck himself. Um, and he has this love interest, this girl that he's known since childhood, um, who he thought he was destined to, to, to marry, who instead winds up losing her virginity to this, um, this guy named David. So this is just a brief kind of description of, of David. Um, Water follows the path of least resistance, Human behavior is predetermined in principle in almost all of its actions and offers few choices, of which fewer still are taken. In 1950, Francesco Di Miola had a son by an Italian starlet, a second-rate actress who would never rise above playing Egyptian slaves. Eventually, in the crowning achievement of her career, she had two lines in Quo Vadis. They called the boy David. At 15, David dreamed of being a rock star. He was not the only one. Though richer than bankers and company presidents, rock stars still manage to retain their rebel image. Young, good-looking, famous, desired by women and envied by men, rock stars had risen to the summit of the social order. Nothing since the deification of the pharaohs could compare to the devotion European and American youth bestowed upon their heroes. Physically, David had everything he needed to achieve his ends. He had an animal, almost diabolical beauty. His eyes were a deep blue, his face masculine but refined, his long hair thick and black. And so he goes on to, to, to take Annabelle's virginity. Um, and you sort of have these descriptions of, of how he, you know, becomes more and more addicted to, to, to sex. Uh, he, of course, abandons yeah. Annabelle. Um, he kind of has a failed attempt to, to achieve rock stardom. And then you have this passage that happens later in the book. And I should... Caveat, this is really disturbing prose, but we got to get a taste for Welbeck here. Um, another character, another primary protagonist, Bruno, is talking about uh, a story that he read in a paper about David and what became of David. Um, it's a really disgusting story, Bruno went on warily. Actually, I'm surprised the papers didn't make more of it at the time. Anyway, it was five years ago. Satanic abuse was still a novelty in Europe. The trial was in Los Angeles and David de Miola was one of the 12 accused. I recognized the name immediately and one of the two who had managed to escape. According to the article, he was probably hiding in Brazil. The charges against him were damning. They'd found hundreds of videos of murder and torture at his house, all neatly labeled and classified. You could see his face in some of them. The video they showed the jury was of the ordeal of an old woman with her granddaughter, an infant. Demiola dismembered the baby in front of the grandmother with a pair of clippers, then ripped out one of the old woman's eyes with his fingers and masturbated into the bleeding socket. He had a remote control for the camera in his other hand and used it to zoom right in on her face. She was crouched on the floor, manacled to the wall in what looked like a garage. At the end of the film, she was lying in her own excrement. The video was three quarters of an hour long, but the police were the only ones to see it. All the jury asked for it to be turned off after 10 minutes. I mean, that's the kind of, yeah. like, I guess, <laughs> yeah, what degree of horror and and depravity that you get in 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 Welbeck, um, and and more. If if anybody ever wants to, I don't think anybody on planet Earth hates the baby boomers more than Welbeck, and yet, um, unlike Wallace, he can't really kind of seem to shake off their approach to sex or this idea that success is this kind of all-consuming life force or that that um has robbed us of love or spirituality um so again very different kind of inheritor of that world that the the, the boomers mm. brought 
But do, yeah, I mean, do either of you guys have thoughts on on Wellback or, or how that kind of sure looks yeah I mean, from Wallace? <laughs> I would argue that sex is always the topic. It is always something that you know. At least if you're no, if you're a woman as well, women, men, that will always be a kind of uh, central. It is a central human drive. So it's going to be reflected in the fiction that people write. Um, love as well, sex and love somewhat uh, interchange, depending on the era, they may be more closely bound <laughs> or less closely bound. But I think what we're th- seeing here is the depiction, re- regardless of era, people are going to write about sex because it is, you know, a, a central topic in their lives. And you're going to see how it is depicted will depend upon the environment and the, the, you know, the mores of the era in which the writer is living. So sex during the age of the great male narcissists, that was written in a kind of like um, almost conceited, uh, you know, triumphant, like, you know, Oh, I like, like, you know, rabbit, rabbit angstrom, um, you know, having a, uh, you know, happy, or, well, whatever, but having a marriage, children, seemingly, a, you know, a good life and, you know, needing to run off and do his own thing. Like that is something that, you know, was endemic to that era of greater security and in, in, and it made sense. And the depictions of sex by those authors are more in tune with a sort of, um, you know, the it's the post, you know, post feminism, but the party is still raging. Things are still going pretty well. So that's how they write about sex from a liberated perspective, but uh, not from a perspective where the culture has uh, embraced a level of degeneracy that makes um, things very grim. So Welbeck is writing after the party has ended. So he, I mean, they're, yeah. they're both writing about sex. And he is writing about sex in the way that men experience it today, which is, you know, omnipresent in the form of pornography, in the form of some, you know, if you're um, uh, West Elm Caleb, omnipresent in general. But even if you're West Elm Caleb uh, writing about these escapades, they would not have, I think, the triumphant, you know, tenor of the, the great male narcissists. It's more, you know, even so even in an age of hypergamy, even the the king is a slave to the overall system, which, you know, kind of um, disempowers men and uh, disempowers families so that that, you know, sex is being written against today, uh, written about against the backdrop of a system where it is, um, you know, totally uh deregulated and that is you know obviously has a negative response on uh, most men's romantic lives family formation and most women's romantic lives as well so of course someone like Welbeck, someone like tacos even is going to have a more black pilled approach to the subject matter but let's let's teleport back to um, you know an earlier time. Let's teleport back to um, you know the the fifties, the the forties, what have you. Uh, um, Hemingway, uh, Fitzgerald, you know all of those kind of uh, lost generation, the thirties, twenties authors writing about sex. They too wrote about sex, of course. They too wrote about love, but they wrote about it in a way that was. Uh, you know, pre-sexual revolution. It was, you know, nevertheless, there there was, you know, their stories were body in a certain sense, but it was more restrained. It was uh, alluded to the act. It was, you know, less. And that, that was a reflection of what was acceptable during that time period. Go back further still, you know, go back hundreds of years to Clarissa uh, by Samuel Richardson you know, it's just, it's just the barest of illusion to sex occurring. And that, that was scandalous in in the time. So I think that the way we write about sex is just, you know, it's a uh, reflection of the current era. The, um, the problem with the great male narcissists 
uh, is just the, the problem. Essentially, I think it boils down to the problem that everyone has with the boomers. <laughs> whether you're a man reading it or whether you're a woman reading it, if a woman is reading it, they're like, they were misogynistic. If you're a man reading it, it's like, oh, they took everything for granted and spent our patrimony. So it's, <laughs> you know, it, that's, you know, that's why there's an issue with these writers. Um, that being said, like, what what's the issue with, um, you know, uh, Welbeck? What's the issue with tacos, myself even? Uh, well, the issue is like, why is this guy such an asshole? <laughs> why is this guy? <laughs> why is this guy being such a dick to women and like, and the men and just kind of like grumpy and you know? Well, you know, it's it's the era we live in, and you know, that's I guess all I have to say on that. Dan, do you? I had a question about about you as as a novelist. Do you did, when when you were writing Nutcranker and when you're writing in general? Do you sort of do you have in mind how these previous generations and, and perhaps even, you know, contemporary writers like, like Welbeck or mm. uh, how they dealt with, with sex? And are you, are, are you just kind of dealing, dealing with, with sex and desire when you write in, in as organic and straightforward a way as possible and, and it sort of comes naturally or are you sort of conscious of this, this legacy of <laughs> i guess i'm kind of well the last hundred years of of sex writing and and how it needs to be approached today yeah i mean uh, number one i'm not thinking about it too um actively when i'm writing i'm just writing but i i think um i to an extent have imbibed the history of our culture and so yeah the the era of the you know the mad men era the great male narcissists uh, that, you know, is part that informs where we are today and where we are today is what most informs my own writing because it informs my own psyche. So if I'm going to get into the character voice of whoever my character is, be it Spencer Grunhauer, be it uh, the protagonist of that short story I recently wrote, Doxing Dom, be it, um, well, I'm actually writing Nutcranker 2 now, but if I ever find another pro protagonist, you know, certainly he will, um, you know, be a product of his era, of his age. And um, yeah, these anxieties, these, you know, issues, yes, it, it does take into account the past. It does take into account the heritage uh, because we all do just walking around. We're all the product of this heritage. So where, you know, if, you know, you have a, a you know, you see a kind of like well-to-do Zoomer, uh, not Zoom, Boomer on a boat, you're just kind of like, I bet that guy only worked like 35 hours a week. <laughs> and that's a, and he got rich, <laughs> you know, like that's, you know, in our minds. And you see like a, you know, a young millennial on a date and you're like, it looks awkward and you're just kind of like, Oh wow! I, I hope this guy uh, doesn't, you know, me too himself tonight or something. <laughs> I, you know, like it's it's all just ambient. It's it's in the air. Mm. Uh, Lomez, thoughts on uh, any thoughts on on Welbeck? Yeah, well, you know, I think I think Dan's completely right that um, the major distinction between the guys we were talking about previously and Welbeck is you know, Welbeck's writing from the perspective of the morning after, you know, this sort of hangover period where you see all of the ugliness um, that's preceded, uh, you know, what, what this hedonism has wrought. And, but there's, there's something else too, which is that, you know, all these other guys like Updike in particular are writing from this point of view of a distinctly sort of American wasp prudishness. And so when they write about sex, as I was saying earlier, it's sort of tormented in this way. There's, you know, a lot of like heavy breathing and um, you can tell that these guys are aware of the sort of sort of transgressions that they're uh, they're performing on the page. Whereas Welbeck is, is a Frenchman um, is coming at this from a totally different perspective, which and, and it's just it's very matter of fact. It, it's not tormented at all. And as bleak as some of these scenes are, he describes it in this almost dispassionate way. It, it just is what it is. Mm -hmm. And there isn't this kind of value judgment or um, 
uh, sort of reflection on a kind of moral valuation of participating in it. It's the world we live in, and, and we just simply have to uh, to sort of deal with it and and reflect it honestly. And you know, we we started this conversation by asking, like, could these guys be published today? You know, Mailer, uh, Updike, Roth, et cetera. I don't know the answer to that exactly. I'm not. I wouldn't be so quick to say no. Definitely not. But um, Welbeck certainly has like mainstream legitimacy, and so we'd we'd at least need to ask, well, why is that? Why is Welbeck allowed to write these things? Um, I mean, I maybe it's just as simple I'm as when you're French, they let you. You know, you can just sort of get away with this stuff. But there I might think be he another also answer. Got in like right before the hammer came down. You yeah. know, like like what what like what, elementary particles is probably early two thousands. And yeah, I mean, like starting by publishing in French probably helps. But um, I mean, I think it's a, I hear people, I hear women comment on Welbeck less often, but, but is the, is your guy, is your sense that the general female take on Welbeck is that he's, he's, you know, yet another misogynist or? Uh, my take is that they actually, I mean, to the extent I've had conversations with people about this, they like him. But um, and the sex is not something they're sort of as concerned about is just the fact that he's I don't know, they might say that he's like somehow a fascist or something, you know, like right. it, it wouldn't I, I haven't heard the critique of him that he's sort of uh, violating some sort of uh, some sort some sort of moral boundary around writing about sex. And I think it really does have to do with the very matter of fact way that he that he writes this stuff. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I haven't had a lot of conversations with people about it. Yeah. Yeah. This is just a, a, a question I noticed in the, the comments here, which is maybe worth addressing. Um, where does Bukowski fit into the GMN characterization? I guess one of the reasons it didn't occur to me to include Bukowski in that, although you're right, he is sort of their peer, is that he's he's very much this blue collar writer. And all of the, I mean, Mailer, Roth, and Updike are kind of the, this from the bourgeoisie. Like these are all kind of college educated, um, you know, upper upper middle class writers. Um, so, I mean, I love Bukowski. Uh, particularly, I like his poetry even more than I do his his fiction. But I don't know if either of you have th thoughts on on Bukowski. In some ways, I suppose he seems like a bridge between the great male narcissists and the, um, the you know, Welbeckian writers of today in that his depictions of sex are more, as far as I've read, more mechanical, more, you know, he is, you know, less of a um, triumphant writer, more of a chronicler of a kind of down and out style of... Um, existence and decline so to i mean to the extent that he was and then yes like as you've mentioned kind of living on the outskirts of prosperity during that era well he was uh perhaps an early adopter of our you know black pilling and melancholy today so i i think that is a, at least that is how i would characterize him and mm -hmm. position him yeah yeah, someone else had had a, a comment, um, and I think I think this is fair. But um, I think that the point that uh, this person is making is that you know, sex and explicit sex goes back back further than the boomers. I, I mentioned Henry Henry Miller at the beginning of the, the stream. I mean, you could go back to the Marquis de Sade as well, I suppose. Sure. And I, I guess it, it's certainly true that there have been, um, you know, cult writers or writers that that take approach sex head on. Um, and I, I, I love Henry Miller. I think the difference is sort of the cultural approach to Mailer and Roth and Updike in that the, like Miller, I mean, his, his books were banned for, for quite some time. It's an actual banned book and was always kind of an outsider and a cult figure. Whereas yeah. these guys are, are real, like Americana, like, you know, if you, if your parents were baby boomers, you had these books, on your shelf if you were like yeah. a you know upper a middle class uh millennial no, no, absolutely that's yeah i mean i i think 
I mean, you could, as you said, you could go back to decide, you could talk about a nice you could talk about, you know, any number of sexually explicit, you could go back to Boccaccio. I mean, there are sex, sexually explicit writers throughout history, but I think what we're more talking about is the way a kind of like hegemonic, um, you know, sensibility approached sex during that age and era. So mm. how did, how was, you know, sex generally approached during the 20s and 30s? Well, I mean, certainly in more, in some respects, yes, more in a libertine fashion than in the 40s and 50s. Um, but I mean, I think that was kind of a, uh, an aberration post World War One, loosening of morals, a uh, little bit of Weimar in there. And um, yeah, I mean, this, I, I think this is not a kind of um, scientific theory, so much as a kind of aesthetic um, paradigm that we're looking at here. Mm. Uh, Lomez, I know you, you mentioned that you've, you've, probably only had had an, an hour um so if, if you need to to head out by, by all means or, or if you wanted to stick around i i wanted to bring in um a few quotes from raw egg nationalist who was who was maybe going to be here with us today i i do have to run um so uh i got a uh, you know some things going on here but um this has been very enjoyable and uh certainly would want to carry this conversation on another time um, there's a lot more to, I think, mine here in terms of especially the progression into from these guys into, I mean, we could go backwards, of course, but I think the more interesting question is where we go forward from here, yeah. and how yeah. we keep thinking about this um, through fiction and narrative and what that might look like. Uh, but in any case, this has been really great. I uh, appreciate it. And um, yeah, we'll talk soon. All right. Thanks again, Lomez. Absolutely. All right. Take care. I'm with you, Lomez. So, so, so Dan, as I mentioned, um, raw, raw egg nationalist was, was planning to be here today. He had something come up, but he has a great essay in man's world. Um, he's clearly a fan of Welbeck. The title of the essay is tilting at black pills. I have my, um, my man's great world essay. 2022 here. Yeah. Yeah. So you got like 10 more minutes to yeah, discuss absolutely. this. I think this might Good. might kind of tie in a little bit to what Lomez was saying with, you know, where do we go from here? Where, where do we move forward? And I think I've been describing um, uh, I've been descri describing Welbeck as, as a pretty black pilled writer. But um, I, I, I will say I'm, I'm pretty sympathetic to uh, Ren's perspective and, and defense of him here. So um, he's talking about a book called Platform, which is about. Um, a man who kind of opens up a sexual tourism industry to the third world. Oh, sure. Um, yeah. And then spoilers, uh, he and his girlfriend basically just get um, violently attacked by jihadists and killed I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> because they're disgusted yeah. at the, uh, the sexual tourism that they've created. Um, and so Ren writes for my purposes, Platform is notable because it reveals a rather more complicated Welbeck than we might otherwise be led to expect. Welbeck, we are told, is the king of the depressing novel, the novel without hope, the, no the novel of life ultimately without meaning. Through the lives of unlikable, maladjusted men, the emptiness of modern Western existence, the inescapable em emptiness, is revealed in unflinching detail. These are the real bitter fruits of the global triumph of liberalism. Welbeck is the novelist of the end of history. He's the incel bard, although he is actually married to a much younger woman, Japanese, I think. Welbeck is blackpilled, if by blackpilled you mean an extreme nihilist, which not everybody who uses the term does, as we'll see. Except Welbeck isn't. Blackpilled, I mean. Rather than the end of history, a flat space without a, a flat space outside meaningful time. What Platforms gives us instead is the shocking, violent return of history, the terrible but also terribly exciting return of contingency to a world which promised only minor ameliorations until the universe finally collapsed in on itself billions of years in the future. And don't forget how spectacularly life imitated art just a week or so after the book's release. I think he might be alluding to Charlie Hebdo with that, but um, yeah. he's referring to, within the book he's referring to this terrorist attack which concludes the book 
Rather than being a novel of despair, Platform is a novel of great hope, or at least that's how I read it anyway. This is the message. Life is not forever destined to be a succession of pleasant, but nonetheless meaningless, sex acts. For those who are lucky enough to get them, of course, until one expires, in, fl in flagrante perhaps, with a nubile young Thai masseuse. No, life might also be a violent death at the hands of a jet ski riding jihadi, or something else equally unforeseen. Possibilities. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, so that's, um, that's I think, uh, I guess it may be a very interesting, um, I don't know, redemptive reading of, of, of Welbeck. Um, I don't know if you have thoughts on that, Dan. I think so. Yeah. I think that Welbeck in his writing, he, um, you know, he is, I mean, to be a, to be a consummate black pillar, to be someone who is just going to only offer black pills, that's, you're, you're probably not a good artist because life is not that simple. Life is not just a simple black pill and that's it. So, you know, the problem is the white pill is maybe not the white pill that you wanted. If the, the white pill is like, yes, there still is vibrancy. There still is the, you know, uh, urge and, you know, drive for greatness and combat. But um, you you don't have it. It's, it's the jihadist who's about to uh, end you. That's the guy who, who has it in, in that scenario. And yeah. that's like, you know, that's not a, uh, maybe not a black pill necessarily, but I would hesitate to call it a white pill. A, uh, it's, it's somewhere in between. And, and that I think is also very much the, the spirit of some of his later works of submission of uh, serotonin, where, I mean, especially with uh, submission, his, you know, idea of a Muslim takeover of Europe it uh, and you know and lo and behold the you know Europeans find it actually has solved a lot of their social problems <laughs> and it's uh, you know is that a white pill I I don't know I I don't exactly regard it as a white pill but yeah. uh, is it a, a black pill um, no it's not not a straightforward black pill either I think you know it to uh, steal a, a line from um, a you know recent luminary of our sphere uh, Lord Yarvin. It's a, a clear pill, you know, mm. he's a, approaching life from, uh, you know, he's writing honestly. And that's all writers, in my opinion, should be clear pilled. All novelists should be clear pilled. You should seek to uh, write about life and your, your own participation in it. Your, you know, if, if you're not writing about yourself, your character's participation in the world as you understand it. And uh, in its, you know, ups and downs and just, you know, in its completeness. And so, yeah, he's not writing black pilled fiction. He's just, you know, presenting, I, I think, uh, the, you know, the state of um, life in the West today, yeah. which is, you know, which is depressing at times. But there's, you know, also, you know, a lot of exhilarating uh, things going on some of which are terrible some of which you know are not necessarily terrible like um you know to shill i mean lomez is no longer on but we uh passage prize is you know about to publish after the war which is a an anthology of flash fiction where all the writers wrote stories about what happens after we win the war the cultural war mm. of course and um and those, you know, stories uh, imagine a, a future and a world that is um, good. That is, you know, uh, I mean, some some of them don't. Some of them, you know, it's a, a bad version of the the world after the war. But uh, regardless, you know, there's um, there's a lot of energy out there, and there's a lot to, you know, both uh, white pill and black pill about. Well said, Dan. That that might be a great time to wrap it up. I will say, maybe I'll give uh, Welbeck the last line. And I will say in his defense that like it, the novels bum me out, but they also make me laugh out loud very often. Yeah. Maybe it's hard to know what the tone is sometimes since it's translated from the French. But I had one line of his uh, that I wrote down where from the elementary particles where he says, 30 years later, 
Bruno was convinced that, taken in context, his life could be summed up in one sentence. Carolyn's miniskirt was to blame for everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. Uh, it boils yeah. down to those thighs. Yeah, it does. It does. Um, some things are eternal. Um, well, yeah. I, I, I mean, my last question I was going to ask you was honestly, if, if you if, if you had been surprised or pleasantly surprised by, by fiction that um, you felt was moving moving the needle or, or moving things in a, in a new and exciting direction um, when, it, when it comes to dealing with these, these issues. And it, but it sounds like that, um, that uh, um, book coming out from passage uh, might, might very well be really, really fertile ground for that. Absolutely. Yeah. That, and I mean, a whole bunch of other writers in our sphere um, I've, I've long been a uh, champion of Caleb Caudell, his uh, novel, The Neighbor, and his collection of short stories, Novelty, just great stuff, really good writer um, that is, you know, writing uh, about men and masculinity from a, uh, you know, a non-cucked perspective, so to say. Mm -hmm. Uh, T.R. Hudson, who yeah, we got a, we got T.R. Hudson in the chat right now. So who is a friend of the pod, and uh, he wrote a an excellent novel entitled Automaton, and everyone should check that out. It uh, imagines a, a future where uh, the east and west, uh, the east and west coasts of the United States have been separated, riven by conflict. And, uh, you know, ultimately it is though, you know, it's a story of family, of, uh, of love, of, you know, um, all those sorts of great basic human emotions. And uh, yeah, tacos, myself, uh, many, you know, many others. I'm, you know, my co-host, Matt Pegas wrote Dragon Day. Everyone should read that. Um, I, I will, I will stop this shill fest before you. Uh, <laughs> no, but it's true. Stop brewing. <laughs> That's brewing, and I think yeah. Hopefully, we're on the the, the cusp of a, a real sea change, as you say, Dan. We shall re reclaim the Holy Land from the the infidel. Um, That's right, the literary Holy Land. Of um, course. <laughs> Vingle, Vingle, <laughs> Vingle also points out. Apparently, I I mistyped and I wrote normal mailer in my description, <laughs> but I, I will say that would be an excellent like Twitter handle. Nor yeah, so, no, that would be normal mailer. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, he's not a very him. normal mailer, I must say. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Dan. Well, I'm going to let you get get back to um, back to your real life. But this was a, a great conversation, and, and we'll we'll do it again soon. Amazing. Thanks for having me on, LT. It's always All right. a pleasure. Take care. Bye.